if I thought about it. <laughs> and I'm taking a break from dating. Hateful towards people just because we have a disagreement. It allows me to do all of the things that I enjoy doing. I get to have a little me time. <laughs> Hey friends! John here and welcome to The Martial Actor and this is The Performer's Playground and I have my first guest ever on the show, <laughs> Monica Moore Smith. Hello! Thanks for joining me, Monica. Thanks for having me. It's I'm like, excited to be here. Thanks! I'm super excited to start this and I was really happy that you like were willing to be on the show and willing yeah. to come on my channel and be interviewed. Super well, thankful! Of course! I was, I mean, I was excited when you asked me and I'm like, to be the first one, it's like, oh. It's exciting. It's it, flattering. Yeah, I don't know. I was like flattered. I'm excited. Exciting thing. Yeah. So we met on set about a year ago when we were was doing it a the year. Film. Yeah, it was like a year. Maybe about two years. <gasps> oh, it was. Yeah. Crazy. It's been a bit. That's so we met funny. On set on like a super mm -hmm. small indie um, called Twice the Dream, mm -hmm. and Monica played the lead, and I was a guy in her band. <laughs> <laughs> so, a guy in yeah, her band. Yeah, just like the drama of the band. Yeah, yeah. Music City, USA. We're gonna go to Nashville? Tell me Please. that doesn't sound amazing. No, it does sound amazing. Us packing our bags. <laughs> With your boyfriend and his band. And so I remember being super impressed when I first met you because mm. it seems like you're always working. Like, mm -hmm. and I feel like that's a really big struggle for Utah actors yeah. to like get work because there there's isn't a not ton as much around here. <laughs> yeah, and so there's yeah. a lot of commercial and there's a lot of industrial, but there isn't a lot of like narrative-driven character work. Mm -mm. That's a lot sparser. Yeah. yeah, and so like, how do you do it? What's your secret? Like, how do you oh. how are you always on set? I, it's not so much like a. Uh, secret talent thing because there's so many talented people right. I like there's so many actors that are better than me it's not like there's always gonna be someone and I guess that's like the the beautiful thing about it so it's like it's not about being the most talented or the best looking or whatever like I feel like it gives me hope that like anyone can potentially do it because I know I'm not the best but you are very good Thank you. oh you're sweet thank you <laughs> knock on wood it's good this is what I feel you know like I care about my work and I try and do my best, but I'm not the best. I have always felt though, ever since college, that like, especially with a creative industry, like acting or any of them really, like art, music, whatever, mm. like there are so many talented people that exist in the world. Yeah. The big difference in my mind between talented people that work and talented people that don't work is usually work ethic for me. Yeah. Like the people that put in the hours and hit the grind and are on the street and like mm -hmm. doing the stuff that they need to do. The in hustle. Order to, right, like the people that hustle. My favorite quote is, um, hard work works when talent doesn't. And that always stuck in my mind because I remember first getting into acting, it was not at all like something I was inclined. Like I, I loved it, but I was not like naturally good at it. I was very shy. I was into sports. I was a tomboy. It's obviously changed. The first audition I had, I was terrified. I cried. I whispered all of my lines. No <laughs> one could hear me. My script was literally soaked because of how much my hands were sweating. And like it was how, so sad. How old were you? Like, when was this? My first audition, this was for theater, and I was like a tween or something. Okay. But I was still enthralled in sports. I was still doing that. So I was like, maybe I'll try this. And it wasn't until like high school and later end of high school that I really got into it uh -huh. that I was like, no, this is what I'm going to do because I was just terrified of it. And I yeah. wasn't great at it. I think I think this is why I do well because it's like part of it's like I'm like I fit into a, a stereotypical box of I'm easy to place. I think part of it is like I'm white and blonde and blue eyed and can be like big and loud and <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like I think part of it is knowing my type and I think because I know my type and I am not afraid of my type. I think a lot of people are like, I don't want to be typecast. I don't want to be typecast. Yeah. And my thing is like, I just want to work. If I'm typecast, I'm okay with that because then I can produce my own stuff mm -hmm. where I'm not typecast. And I'm, and I, I think that's more interesting. It's like, I love playing my type and I've embraced it, but then every now and then it's fun to like do something totally different. And I have those people and I can, you know, just produce something if I want. 
to really branch out. And so I think a lot of people fight the typecasting, but it's like, think, think from the director's point of view, from a casting director's point of view, if I'm thinking of a role, like whoever comes to mind is who I'm more likely right. to cast. No, I think that's really good advice. I think, yeah. and you're totally right. I think, I feel like a lot of actors will fight against their type, mm -hmm. and, but. And I really, get it, like I get it. Well, and it's scary because it's like, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. But if you lean into it and lean into what your type is, it's a great way to get established. Yes. And then exactly what you're saying. Like once you have a foot in the door, once you are starting to make connections, mm -hmm. once you have momentum, you can capitalize on that and then move where you want. Exactly. I mean, that's what like Adam Sandler just said. He did Uncut Gems, which is totally not <laughs> right. his thing. But he's like, he's made money. He's established himself. Then that's when you get the flexibility to do what you want. But otherwise, people just don't know where to put you. Right. Uh, so that, I don't know. That's, I don't know if that's the secret. And I could have it all wrong. <laughs> I'm like, someone's going to watch this and be like, BS. I don't she's, know. Saying, she's saying good advice. Okay, so mm -hmm. tell me a little bit more about your process for building your characters. Like, what, mm -hmm. what's your process when you get a script, when you're building a character, when you're fleshing out their backstory? Like, what do you do? Do you have any go-tos, any tips or tricks? Like, mm -hmm. I think... So I think it's different for everyone. And I think I've read a lot of Uta Hagen and like Sam Meisner, and I come from a theater background. So I think a lot of it would be theater-esque, but I feel like I take from everywhere. But for me, I loved listening to Anthony Hopkins and there was an analysis video, um, I think from a YouTube channel. Well, actually, I suppose I'm a method actor. Yeah, but you deny that, don't you? I am a method actor, really. I have my own personal method. Yeah. But what I, I've simplified it now and I, I absorb the text. I sort of absorb the text. Uh, take it in. I, 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 I the script the tells script. you what? Well, the script is the script. I mean, the, all the information I need is the lines that have been written by Bill Nicholson or Shakespeare, whoever he is. There, put, put it into the computer, which is up here, which we all have at the computer, yeah. and um, let it program it. Put it in there. Let it cook. Let it gestate, and then when you turn up on the set or the stage or wherever you're going to rehearse or do or shoot the film or whatever. Relax. That's the most important thing to program yourself is to relax and say, okay, no deep meditation, but say, okay, I'm relaxed. And then come on. Okay. And when they say action, let the part play through you. And I find that that is the, for me, the most surprising thing is that the part, the character plays through you, through your instrument, your body, your mind, your psyche, and it filters through you and will take its own course. And what I, I what, what the fun I get out of it is the real fun is. Uh, never knowing which what's going to happen next, and even on stage, if you're repeating a performance, you, you're not quite sure what's going to happen next. And I think that's what you have to do with the other actors: keep it fluid. Or I, I, what I got from him was that he goes through his script and he just reads it, and he reads it over and over and over again. And essentially, the point is that he has he has the words so ingrained in him that the words themselves don't mean anything. So then he, so essentially, the words at that point don't have like preconceived notions or biases on them that it's really just a paintbrush and paint mm -hmm. at that point so that he can take the words and just as he's going through the scene use them as like malleable clay and and I think that's beautiful because we always talk about like oh in scenes you're supposed to be reacting acting isn't acting it's reacting mm -hmm. and I think only then when you're comfortable enough with the material can you really feed off of the other person because right. yes. otherwise otherwise if all the words already mean something in one way and you have one way of doing it then it's just going to be it's like what's the point then you can't react yeah you can't react yeah. and then people can tell when they're watching a scene because you're not connecting they're not connecting mm -hmm. no one's connecting and especially when you're working with great actors where they're feeding off you every take can be different right so it's like you take that you know the script really well you do the character work, which essentially for me is like, I take my character and I come up with a base of like, you know, like a storybook character, sure. where I'm from, where I grew up. Uh, but then I think it's very important to go through and then I flesh out relationships. Yeah. Because I think a lot of people will do personal character work, but then not relationships. But it's all about reacting, so you need to know. Yes. For me, I really enjoy figuring out specifically when it comes to relationships with the mm -hmm. dynamic. Are. I feel yes. like power dynamics in relationships can give you Huge. so much ammunition to use in a scene. And so I think once you have that, then you can be, you can just play around. And if you have good actors you're working with, then really the scene will, like, you'll get into the flow. The scene will work itself out. You just have to have that 
groundwork. And I also think like just living real life and being very observant, knowing yourself, because we always say like, well, you can't love someone else unless you love yourself. It's hard because when you say you can't love anyone else until you love yourself, you can't know anyone else until you know yourself. It's, it's like, like, well, I don't are, know myself. Those are constant journeys. Those are, those yeah. are constant relationships that you have to continually cultivate mm -hmm. with yourself yeah. as well as with other people. So, yeah. I, I, yeah, I do feel like it's it's a hard thing to... It's it's not black and white. Yes, it's not black and white. But I think I think it's the I think it's the aspiration and the journey towards that that mm -hmm. gets you there. And I think also too like when I have a block in a scene where it's like I have a mental block, it's usually because there's something going on personally mm -hmm. that I'm not addressing or that my character also feels and I don't like the fact that we're similar because <laughs> when I see it in my character, I see it as a flaw and then it means I'm flawed and then I don't like that. Right. And then I think that People tend to have an image or an idea in their mind that's, that they or certain people can't do or would never do certain things. Whereas but that's not I think true. It's, yeah, I think it's very much more like everyone has the potential to, to be like the greatest good or like the worst evil. Mm -hmm. And it really just depends on what your breaking point is. Yeah. Like, what circumstance are you in? What people do you have to be surrounded by in order to be that way or live that certain way? Or on the flip side, like what kind of sequence of events has to occur in this right combination in order to trigger you to get to that to, to reach to your full point. capacity yeah. so that you switch yeah yeah i think it's a much that's a more great interesting point way to look at characters it's true and i but i think i think that takes humility <laughs> because it means you have to open yourself up to the idea of, that you would do certain things right. that you're like that's not me i wouldn't do that i'm too good for that uh, but I think it's also empowering. Because I pride myself on the fact that I'm like, I don't, I don't like blow up at people. But it's empowering because you're making that choice. It's not mm -hmm. that you can't, it's that you choose not mm -hmm. to, which is so much better, right? But, but, but it means <laughs> we cannot truly like reach our potential if we do not know our potential for evil and our potential mm -hmm. to be bad and to mess up. We have to be aware of that. And I think it's the same thing of like, we can't appreciate being happy without being sad. Right. Like, I think it's that opposition. And it's like, the times that have been the hardest of my life, I've also been the happiest. Like, I've also been the most mm -hmm. rewarding. And so I think it's like, we have to be able to see the worst in ourselves and the worst in characters in order to make active choices. Because otherwise it's ignorance. Right. So, man, this is like, it's oh, all, it all comes great. full circle. So, real talk. I want to dive a little bit deeper and talk that. about you. So you already mentioned Saturday's Warrior. I mm -hmm. feel like that's what you're most known for. Yeah. It really like put you on the map locally mm -hmm. and very really solidified your image as this very strong Utah actress. And er, so, sure. <laughs> I don't like. I feel like weird. Thing. Yeah, totally. Like this <laughs> Utah actress. But anyway, since Saturday's Warrior, you've gotten a lot of work, and it's just been consistent for you. Mm -hmm. So. We kind of touched a base on this already about building this brand that is mm -hmm. very like white, blonde, more yeah. Utah. Like, are you very a specific, very right, specific. like a very specific image? Uh -huh. Are you trying to like branch out to LA or New York or Atlanta? And if so, like, just how does that work in your mind? And like, what are you thinking about that? I think that that's something I get asked a lot. And it's very interesting because it's something people are very curious about. And it's, so I do think about it a lot. But at the same time, part of me is like, this is who I am. And I kind of just have to roll with that because if I don't roll with who I am and all my like basicness, then it's like it's just not going to read true. And that might rub some people the wrong way. I know certain things I do now rub some people the wrong way. But like at the end of the day, it's like, well, I can hide and then it's like not authentic and then people still like find out who you are at the end of the day so it's like and I think also too like at the end of the day it's about connection why am I doing this and if I end up making film just to like put myself on this pedestal of like perfect Mormon that doesn't relate to anyone even like people who are perfect Mormons like we all have messy stuff I feel like I especially get it because like for the past couple years I feel like a lot of people saw me as like perfect Mormon and has this perfect marriage and just lives the perfect life. Well, so getting into that. <laughs> and it's like, it's not true. Like no one relates to that because it's not real. I want to talk about your mm -hmm. platform because mm -hmm. you are an influencer. You have 
four and a half thousand followers on YouTube, eighteen thousand mm-hmm. on TikTok, and like forty five thousand on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And you've been like really open and honest about your journey with both your divorce mm-hmm. and like the abuse you experienced in that relationship. Mm-hmm. Like, what made you want to do that? What made you want to be open and vulnerable in that way? And how's it been navigating? social media and trying to be vulnerable in that way in such a like deeply personal way Mm. in this platform where it's like this parasocial connection yeah i think i think there's lots of reasons i think i I guess i was in that relationship for like two and a half years of marriage technically and then also another year of the relationship i think coming from there where it was i wasn't allowed to say anything i wasn't allowed everything had to be perfect and I had to be happy and if I wasn't happy enough then there were issues and and I was in trouble was that like a self-imposed kind of image or was that I mean there's from him or was that kind of both there's there's a course I think it's there's it's there's gray area it's like there's both definitely Uh part of it is oh well if I'm not happy, then I'm in trouble, and then there's consequences, and right. these are the natural consequences I well, was told of like me not being like, happy enough because right. of not being a good wife. Right. Like when you get married um, super young, you feel all this pressure about like if I'm not happy, then I'm not doing it right. Yeah. Because I yeah. should be happy because I'm married. And I I'm should married. be like at full capacity, right. and I'm not. And a lot of that was me being told I wasn't, and that. Um, I mean, I think that's a whole kind of other thing of like going into abuse and the manipulation and kind of brainwashing and like Mm -hmm. gaslighting that over time, because I was very like confident and like I felt like happy with life and fairly resilient. Um, But definitely, you know, the more you get deeper into an abusive dynamic, the harder and more confusing it is to know what's like right and wrong and what's healthy and what's not because you just get to a point where like looking back my journals it was like distinguishing reality from not reality of like and I was told that like verbatim like my reality like isn't real and my perception isn't real and I can't trust myself Um, and I was told that daily so like it it brings Yeah. yeah it makes things a lot of confusing but of course like I'm not perfect and I have like lots of things that I'm now seeing like that I want to work on to be a better partner and to be a better person um, and to like, you know, figure out how I want to live my life. So it's definitely been like an amazing learning experience. And I want to be careful like anyone who's listening because I think no one's perfect in a relationship, but I think when someone approaches someone about a relationship that's abusive, people go, oh, well, it takes two to tango. And in healthy relationships, it does, but in an abusive dynamic, it doesn't matter what you do. You could be perfect and the abuse will still happen because right. the abuse is solely coming from the partner. Victims are not at fault in abusive relationships. Yes. And like all like normal relate, like healthy, normal relationships have aspects where people hurt each other and people need to work on things, obviously. But I, I, but I think there's an abuse dynamic once there's, the abuse circle where it's the cycle of control and manipulation and then explosion and then the honeymoon phase. That is like, it is, I like to separate and distinguish those. And it's because it's centered around control. And when someone is trying to gain control over someone else, it is going to escalate, 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 escalate until it gets to the point where, well, then you've got domestic violence charges. So I, I want to be careful because I don't want if someone watches this and is in that situation because I know a lot of people are. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if there's like a healthy relationship, like, yes, take accountability for what you're doing. But once abuse becomes a part of the picture, it's a different thing and you can't treat it. You can't diagnose it the same way. Mm-hmm. Abuse is not your fault yeah. <laughs> is what well, I'm trying I to say. That that's a, I mean, in this situation, it's sometimes hard and scary to label it like that because yeah. you want to take accountability. Yeah. You, want to be like, you don't want the person like right. you've committed your life to. You don't want to see them that way of like, wait, this isn't what I thought. It's really hard to make that leap. Right. And most victims from what I've seen and from the people that have talked to me and the people that I've worked with, the amount of women that I've seen who are to the point where it's like, they're getting physically abused every day because the emotional has been so bad to the point where you're like, I don't want to be here anymore. Like I was literally praying, like you literally get to the point where you're praying for it to get physical because then you'll be taken out of your misery. And it's something you don't, like I didn't get it until I was in it. And now having this community of so many women that I know who have gone through 
you know, abusive situations on all spectrums that it's like, I haven't run into a single one that has like run to being a victim. I haven't run into a single one that has like wanted to be that. Sure. Before going through this experience, I probably wouldn't be as like, I'd be local to take accountability. Like it takes you to tango. But now I feel like, oh, I get it. Is that one of the reasons that you wanted to like be so open about it online though, was to like create communities for women or like? Yeah, like... I think there's a lot of things. I'm like, part of it's like, I'm very religious and like, and so for me, that's one thing that like strengthened my connection with God and myself and with other people and has strengthened my like ability to love. That was like the one thing that I knew, like everything else was so confusing. I felt like I couldn't make a decision to take a shower or not because I was so like not mentally there at that point. But I did know that like God loved me and I mattered. But I think, I think it's that and I think not a lot of people talk about it. And it's so common. It's so, so freaking common. The amount of women that are currently in Christian communities, ladies, like if you go to a church, one in three women sitting at the pew are in an abusive relationship. And a lot of them don't even know because they think it's all their fault and they're weak and they're terrible and they don't deserve to be here and they deserve the abuse. And, but they're sitting in church. And that's why I remember thinking the first time when I started seeing things and understanding and going to therapy, it was like, oh my gosh, how many women am I sitting around that right now feel exactly the way I do? And I had no idea because I felt so alone. Right. I just felt like I just wanted to die because it was like, no one knows, no one knew. And, I, and it was so funny because there were so many times I'd be like, I would be, I remember distinctly, I was doing a photo shoot and I remember, cause he would like whisper things into my ear. Like it was, it's, everything was very like presentational and like, look at this perfect relationship and I have to uphold this perfect relationship. Cause if I posted things that were not, like I didn't seem happy enough, then it was a problem. Um, and so we were in front of a bunch of photographers and he'd like whisper stuff in the ear that I was embarrassing him and that like, kind of just whispering something mean to me, but then like kissing me and holding me. And so everyone else, all the photographers were going, oh my gosh, you guys are so cute. You're so lucky. I want a husband like that. Like, I remember just thinking in the moment, like, help me. My thought was I'm surrounded by people and I feel so alone. Like I have all these people around me and I have someone right next to me and I feel completely alone. I, it, it, that I think was kind of a metaphor is like, I think I got pushed so far that one way where, and I, you know, was isolated from friends and families so that I couldn't say anything to anyone. And if I did, and if I saw a friend at the gym, I was in trouble because he was suspicious that I was saying something to them and I was telling them and people knew like the, our relationship got worse and things got worse if I didn't uphold the image. So I did. And it was the most dark, lonely place of my life is when people thought things were the best. It, yeah, ha- it yeah. was the complete opposite of when things seemed like the peak to other people, when, when I was like, I don't wanna be here anymore. When I'm like on the road, just like taking everything in me to like not just like, you know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. And I realized like, I learned the hard way of like, that is not what I want. Right. I think we talk about authenticity a lot, but it's like, I would much, much rather have something be messy and imperfect and, you know, not like that great if it was honest. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but Um, going back to like, just like why I'm doing it, I think especially in the religious community, there was like a couple people that I saw that were kind of like talking about divorce and... I like couldn't tell anyone except for like DM a girl on Instagram. Well, and sometimes it's easier it to is. be vulnerable with people that you don't know because yeah. there's less risk. There's less <laughs> risk and like if I told friends, like I knew he would know. So I, I knew if I told anyone then he would know and then I'd be in trouble. So I couldn't. So I didn't even dare risk that. Mm-hmm. So like I felt like I could ask like a vague question on Instagram. I didn't even like say like anything about myself. I just like Asked like in this in question. Instance, yeah, in happened? theory, 
And since you've been through divorce right. and experienced abuse. And so like that was how I figured it out was that means. And I was like, oh my gosh, we need more of this. Yeah, well, I think that's, that's really awesome that you've created communities where people can be open with you about that kind of yeah. thing. Like as, so as a gay man, like mm -hmm. I, I often got asked the question, like, why didn't you come out to me earlier? Like mm -hmm. from friends, from family, from my parents. Yeah. My parents were like one of the last people to know. Like some of my friends' parents knew before my parents. Yeah. But it's because like the closer the relationship is to you, the more risk you have about losing it. And so mm -hmm. the harder it is to tell them. Yeah. A lot of times it's easier to message a stranger on Instagram. Because there's, and, there's you're not going to no lose risk. anything. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so that's why I'm like, I'm hoping to give that alternative, like, safe place to people. Also just educational to like, because it's really confusing. Yeah. And when people don't talk about it, you just don't know. It's true. And the you more know? voices that we can have in media, you know, providing narratives that aren't cookie cutter, happy all the time kind of Here, thing. Here I'm just more... eating my skinny oh, tea right. and life is great. Right. Nothing wrong with skinny tea. It was, but like no. the more the more voices we can see, especially from like role models in the community about mm -hmm. you know difficult times and how we navigate them, and the, the yeah. more real aspects of life, I feel like the better off we will be as a society. Oh yeah, and then we'll all realize like, oh wait, we don't have to like put on this front because right. we're all kind of messed up. Right. And then it's like, oh, and then we can relax, and then it's like, and I think, and then you feel loved. Well, and I feel like a lot of that comes Hoy. from. The, a lot of it comes from the mindset of if I am good, then good things will happen to me. Yes. And that's not true. It's not. Not true at all. Like, no. Shit happens and to And I'm everyone. learning that and the so, freaking hard way. Well, and it's like because people believe that, they also believe in the inverse where if bad things starts happening to them. Then, then it you means must then, be bad. And which that's, is also not true. Yeah. I thought, well, if I deserve this. I deserve the abuse. Right. And because like, I must be doing something wrong and I just haven't figured out what it is or yet. Or like I am being punished for something. Something, or, yeah. yeah. And so this is why I'm giving this, given this challenge because... And I have to overcome it. Yeah. Such yeah. a toxic mindset. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really hard place to live, but it's mm -hmm. all fallacious. It's totally not true. Like people it's like, have inherent worth. You don't have to earn your right to live. You no. don't have to earn your right to be treated like a decent person. Like, but how many of us act in the world as if we, th though we feel that way? Right. I think a lot of us feel that way. Yeah. And it's like, and it's because of these little things that it's like, it's really hard to re rewire our brains to like, yes. not, not act so like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. Okay, what happened to you isn't your fault, but it's your responsibility to heal from it. At the end of the day, you can't control other people. You have your external locus of control. It's like, that's limited. But like, I don't want to be the person that takes that and like goes, well, I was hurt, so I'm going to hurt you. Right. No, toxic cycles of mm -hmm. hurt are not good. No. I think it's like, I can't say for someone else's experiences, oh, well, they should have just done this. Because people could also look at my experience and go, well, why didn't you leave sooner? I think a lot of people, when they're trying to help someone in an abusive situation, is to tell them what to do. Right. And that's the problem is because... If they're being abused, the person who's abusing them is already telling them that they are incapable right. of making good choices. I was told I was incapable of understanding what's best for me. Mm -hmm. So I shouldn't make choices because I'm not smart enough. And when you're already getting told that narrative and then when you have the people that you love telling you like, well, you should leave, you should leave. Right. It's like, then you just feel like, well, I can't make good choices, so I shouldn't right. make a decision. And then you get paralyzed and then you're just stuck there. If you are in an abusive situation, like I can't tell you to leave. I can't tell you to stay. That is none of my business. I can educate you on like what I know and share my experience on how I decided to leave. But at the end of the day, if you're in that situation, you know best. You are the master of your own life. Mm -hmm. Like more power to them because- No, I feel like there's so many narratives between what you're saying between your abusive relationship and then deciding to leave and just being a gay man, especially in like a Christian community. Yeah. Because like coming out is the same thing. People that are out, I feel and have had the experience where they often try to 
prescribe people that are in the closet to come out right then as soon as possible yeah it's like well why aren't you doing it like me yeah and it's like no like you you especially as like a gay man you should never be outing someone else like you should never be outing someone and robbing them of their journey robbing them of their choice because you don't know their situation Mm -hmm. you don't know if it's safe for them you don't know mentally if they're ready for it you don't know the ramifications that it's going to have on their life yeah there's a lot of parallels right and like you should respect their choice and respect their timeline Mm -hmm. because if you rush it it's not going to help them. It's going yeah. to hurt them. Well, because at the end of the day, when you're trying to do that, you're trying to take that person's agency. Which is exactly what an abuser is already doing. Yes. I don't know. They're very, they're different, but there's so many similar aspects. Mm-hmm. And I love that. Uh, but yeah, I think I think it comes down to like, this is my journey, but I don't want anyone to like, see either of ours and go, well, I need to do it that way. Or if I don't, then I'm stupid. Right, and it's no, like, it's like, no. Yeah, everyone uh-uh. is on their own place in their mm-hmm. own going at their own pace and, yeah because yeah. that's when like people could say i should have left earlier and people did but like i feel like i i left at the right time and i'm in the right place and that's imperfect and that's great uh i do just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show oh. i think that this was great i'm thank super you. happy you're here and again this I'm is so fun good Thanks for and having I'm, me i was really pleased with how it all turned out Honestly, like, I've been super nervous about this. Really? So, yeah, I mean, like, oh. doing a new segment is... I it think, is. That's like, scary, you're, so. you're, I'm like, you have the pressure on you. I'm like, I just show <laughs> up and, like, if you don't like it, you don't use it. But, no, like, thank you know, you again. No, because I, I love talking to you. You're very, like, articulate and oh, you, you have lots of great insights. And you're, I think you're very good at, like, seeing things from multiple perspectives. That's really nice of you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's all we've got for you today. So take care of yourself. Take care of each other. And we'll see you next time. <laughs> the aggressive. The aggressive. Oh <laughs> I like it. It's a dramatic ending. Yeah. Is it recording? Yes, it is. Oh, it was. Oh. <laughs> that's what I'm like. <laughs> the zen is good. Yeah, I've like become a plant guy. You're a plant dad. That's I so know. cute. <laughs> <laughs>